Okay, our Zoom session should be active. See if you can connect back to it. Oh, and I have this beautiful seating chart from all of you guys as you went through your presentations and I've lost it. Darn it. It's hard to keep track of 24 people. I think I've got everybody now a little bit better. I can figure it out. But it was almost done. Okay, you last two. Last but not least. Oh, okay. So we're not quite to those last two. Thank you. <laughs> you go right ahead. Get that. We can't see your presentation. <laughs> it's like deja vu. I know. It's like deja vu. I'm like, is it okay? <laughs> Vincent has that power. <laughs> His major is computer science, and he plans to become a software developer. He plans to finish his associate's degree, and hopes to continue on to a bachelor's degree. Nice. Man, yay! Oh, sorry, you weren't done. Some interesting facts about him, he likes to play the trumpet, and he also likes to cook. Now we're ready, yay! I'll be uh, introducing Chelsea Hudson. She is currently a graphic and print media coordinator at TLC Properties. She's here at OTC to earn a certificate of achievement in CIS. Her goal is to move into UI UX web design. She has a Doberman named Bella and enjoys indoor gardening. Very nice. Thank you. Introducing Dylan Brotherton. Uh, Dylan currently works for its media group as a business intelligence reporting analyst. Um, he's attending OTC to earn his associates in CIS, which will help him grow in his current position. Uh, he's married, has two sons um, who play baseball, which he participates in um, as a coach. Uh, he serves on the Springfield Little League board where he assists with web design among any other, uh, many other things. And he is also a home DIYer who likes doing projects um, <laughs> and taking photos of them. Uh, okay, we got everybody. Nobody left out. Great job. I really liked seeing all of them. Now, we're going to, like I said, split up into our study groups. And what I did since our room is kind of the way it's organized, we really need the same groups of four, right? Otherwise, it doesn't work very well at all. So we're going to look at Canvas and see what study group you're in. But our study group one will meet here, two, three, four, five, and six. So we'll just take a few minutes to get together with our study group and then go back to the seats where you're sitting at. So you don't have to move you know, for the rest of class, but we'll do that. So let's see what study group you're in. I'll share my screen so we can all see it. Let's see, I guess this one. So in Canvas, if you go to the people link, you'll see all of our people. And there's a tab up here for CIS 120 study group. And that's what we want to look at. And if you're connected to the Zoom session, I should be broadcasting this screen because I know how hard it is to see from the back. So that Zoom session should have this. So we just have the six study groups with four people each. So we do have someone 
absent will have one group that's missing somebody. You should be able to tell from this what study group you are in. I know your display looks a little different than mine. Okay, so now that you know what study group you're in, let me show you one more thing before we go into our groups. Each group has their own home page. So if you click on this stack thing here, you can choose visit group home page. Now for each group then in Canvas, you have all these resources. You could create announcements just for your study group or pages and discussion boards if you wanted to, you know, if you're really tough on your group. And what I want you to look at are collaborations. So when you look at collaborations, you should see this shared document and try to open it and let's make sure everybody can open it because study group five and six, I did have weird errors when I tried to create this. Make sure they can all open so when you click on that, it should open. If you're not signed in to your OneDrive, it is, that's probably because of the crash, because I think they have it set up where you're signed in automatically anymore. But you might have to go back out of the study group, or an easier way is just to open a new tab and go to OneDrive.com and log in using your OTC account, and then you should be connected. Let's see if it lets everybody get to it. Is anybody able to access it? You're in five and it's letting you access it? Let me see if I can redo the security. Which study group are you in? Three. Three? Hmm. Okay. So we have somebody in, in group five that's been able to access it. Do we have people in group three that are being able to? What about group six? You're able to? Okay, great. So if you're not being able to access it, don't get too worried about it. You won't be able to participate in the note taking, but I'll make sure you have access to that document right away so that you can use it with everybody else, the rest of your group, to take care of the note taking for you today while we get those issues resolved. Um, let's go ahead and move to the study group. Now, I just want you to spend five or ten minutes. What I'm going to do while you're doing this, I want to create a group to ask some questions about your classes so you can remember what. And I'm not going to ask. Share and other questions about each other. So I'm going to be trying to create that information about you guys while you're meeting with your study group. So with your study group, talk to each other. Decide who should be the leader. Is there one person that feels like they, they don't mind kind of elbowing everybody else as we're working on things to say, hey, you guys have this done? Do you need help with this? You know, kind of take a leadership role on these notes in case there's some people that disagree on what the format should be. So that would be a good thing for you. So let's go ahead and I'm going to set my um, alarm for just five minutes. So move around study group one here, two, three, four, five, and six. And shove your stuff up under the table or something and take it with you if you're worried about it. <laughs> Thank 
Sorry, I know it's so awkward to rearrange. We'll make it worth it. <laughs> as long as you don't mind. I know it's just hard on everybody though. It's like I can't leave my stuff. <laughs> okay, I set the alarm. Five minutes for you to meet with your study group. Do it. No, just decide who's going to be kind of in charge and make sure you guys are all in agreement with things.
Okay, it's ready. Wrap up your meetings and let's head back to our original desks and we'll see how much we remember about each other. I've got some good ones. There was some good info in the presentations. I like this one. It, it doesn't look, lend itself super well to programming. It works, Kahoot's works really well for PC maintenance and stuff with pictures. Okay, if you've never done a Kahoot's before, you're just going to go to www.kahoot.it and put in this main pin, and that'll connect you to our Kahoot. Put the www in front of it. And your Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Good, I was like, we have all been able to get to it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
We should have one more. Look around, see if you can tell who it is if they need some help. One more, one more, one more. We'll just go ahead with that. Hearing none. This one's a sample. Pick the correct answer. Now, with the cahoots, notice it doesn't show you the words on your screen, so you might want the Zoom session going. It's up to you. Once <laughs> everybody got it. The blue must have been on top. Huh? Okay, now a real one. Vincent got it faster than anyone. What is my name? <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. That's pretty good. I'll take that. He's a shy beatboxer. <laughs> Pretty good. You guys are doing it. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> uh, who remembered to finish the syllabus first? Huh? 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 That's okay. So either answer is right because it's not due yet. But don't forget about it because you're going to have that really nice three day weekend and you're going to forget. <laughs> we don't have school Monday, so three day weekend. So don't forget to get it done. A tube inspector that likes puzzles. Good job. Okay, this is a real HQ question. Scientists recently established that a river in South America surprisingly does what? Isn't that weird? Nobody thinks that that would be it. I don't think I want to see it. <laughs> Who's a rocker that likes dogs? Very good. I always think it's amazing when the majority of people get it right. Because I am terrible at remembering people and you guys do so good. Works at Planet Fitness, Planet Fitness and likes to watch Netflix and chill. <laughs> or just chill, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knew it was a two letter name, so I had to put them both in there. <laughs> yeah, I revised. Which of these animals has been elected to office in the US? You remember? <laughs> You all. Where was the meal probably from? Yeah, it's a question from HQ. So my original Cahoots was based on HQ, which is a trivia game online. Yeah. It's actually Missouri because all Grand Canyon mules come from Missouri and you know, Missouri is the best place to get mules. That's why our state animal is the mule. Likes rock climbing and has been to six states. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> That's really good. Sunny's on fire here. A high school volleyball coach. She just sounds terrifying to me. <laughs> Last one, buzz of war. Let's see who's the fastest here. They've got this fancy new awards show. <laughs> good job, good job. And look, it's even got all the confetti. Like, yay. <laughs> Go. And look, you got 10 out of 13. That's really good. So I'm going to leave that. Great job. We'll do a few cahoots, but it's hard to do coding questions with cahoots because you can't see it very good. So let's now go ahead and get into your collaboration document, your notes. And I'm going to bring up that first presentation. So there's another presentation loaded to Canvas, which is the textbook presentation. This one that we're looking at, if I can get it to work right, is um, an, a revised one. Hang on, it doesn't want to display on the right. There we go. Take me forever. So we're here, we're ready to do our introduction to programming. And when you're computer programming or doing software development or software engineering or whatever term it is that you're using to describe what you're doing, you're really problem solving, right? Because the whole reason we write or develop any sort of app is usually to solve a problem. Now a game, the problem might be that you're bored that might be the problem that you want to solve. So sometimes it's not as much of a problem as others. But that's really how computers developed. Um, there wouldn't have been a push to create these things if there weren't terrible, awful, menial tasks that people wanted to get away from. Right? They wanted somebody else to do it. So when we're problem solving, there's a scientific approach to problem solving. So first of all, we have to understand the problem. So there's some an analysis that goes on there. If we got some sort of information from our management that a new application was desired, we're going to need to talk to the people that want that new application. Find out what do they want it to do? What kind of problem is it going to solve? What kind of output does it need? All those kinds of things. Now as we're talking and going through all of this understanding mode, analyzing, we are going to be begin devising a plan. And that's really our second step. Come up with a plan. Step-by-step -step instructions, how we're going to solve this problem. After we've got a plan, we're going to execute it. In our world, that's going to be coding, programs, testing, doing things like that. Um, you know, in a city world, it might be uh, monitoring the new traffic light to make sure it doesn't cause additional congestion. You know, what, whatever kind of thing it was that we were trying to solve a problem for. And then finally, we've got to review the results. Did it work? And I'm sure you guys have seen things like that happen where something was done by the city or by whatever, some sort of entity to solve a problem. And in the end, it didn't solve the problem. It might have made things worse. And we won't ever know that unless we review the results. So these are our big, big important steps in problem solving. So this is true 
whether we're at home trying to figure out how to come up with enough money to pay all the bills or whether we're at work trying to solve a problem for users with software. We're going to go through basically these same steps to be successful at solving that problem. I'm going to leave that there for you for just a second. Everybody, I think everybody's about done with it. So those step-by-step -step instructions that we need to make when we're solving a problem could be considered an algorithm. And an algorithm is a step-by-step -step set of instructions. So I've got an algorithm here for how to get to my neighborhood from OTC. So when I leave school, I, can, I leave OTC, and I usually do this, I leave OTC heading south on Sherman, that one by Rapp, and I go down a block or two and I turn left on traffic way. Traffic way goes under Glenstone, so I don't have to go across Glenstone. And I merge on the Chestnut Expressway, I turn right on Barnes, and I turn left on Cherry, or I go further down to turn left maybe on Bennett. So that's how I get to my neighborhood. When I look at those instructions, a couple of things, questions come up right away. Is that the only way I could get to my neighborhood? No, there's all sorts of ways I could get to my neighborhood from here, right? So this algorithm is just one possible solution. There are many other solutions available, but this solution solves the problem and gets me there. So it's a usable algorithm. Now, if I had something in here where I went way out of my way, way over to the other side of town and back, I actually know some people who drive that way around Springfield and you know it's just like the first time they got shown how to get somewhere. Somebody went way out of their way and then they do that all the time. Or their phone tells them to and so they do it all the time. That wouldn't be the best solution, but it would still be a solution. So we have to always be looking at our solutions to try to refine them, make sure that they're as good as they can possibly be. Okay, so I want you guys to take a couple seconds and work with the person beside you. And I want you to grab a piece of paper, and there's some in the printer and stuff if you don't have any, because I know you might not have brought any. And I just want you to write down the instructions on how to get to your neighborhood from OTC. If you have to look at Google to yes. get your instructions, that's okay, but I don't want you to write down the instructions from Google Maps. I want you to you know, put that in your own words but, uh, with your neighbor. What I want you to do, write down your instructions, and your neighbor's going to write down their instructions, and then I want you guys to look at each other's notes. Would you be able to find their neighborhood from their instructions, or are there pieces <coughs> missing? Do you think maybe it would be kind of hard? <coughs> Lots of people use a map to get home, so it's okay if you have to look at Google.
Do what? I always have people that are like from Hartville or something. <clears throat> Summarize. Yes, yeah, so you get your instructions down, talk to your neighbor, see if they can follow your instructions. Great. 
Okay, how's everybody feeling? Did you do a good job with your instructions? What do you think? Could they find it? It's nice that you can go to Google and you can get that validation, right? You can kind of see if you've gotten all the steps in there in your, in your algorithm. So we can use that to double check. So that's good. But that's an algorithm. So if I wanted to write an algorithm to like just add two numbers, I would put something, some steps like this. Ask for the first number. Ask for the second number, add the two numbers, display the result. And that could be my algorithm. So depending on what I'm doing, it might change. They're still getting each other's houses. <laughs> Which is good. No, it's not letting me click. Let me click back over here. Now click. There we go. So what is programming? A lot of you know, you're super aware of it. But just to define, a program is a list of instructions. The instructions are executed by a computer to accomplish a task. Creating those instructions is programming. And why doesn't everybody do it? Because it can be kind of difficult. So it's not an easy, easy job. I have this link here for this YouTube video, but we're gonna wait until next week to watch it, because I don't wanna watch it right now. We've already jumped around enough today with our power problem. We'll watch it later. But it is um, Bill Gates and a bunch of people talking about programming. So a lot of times people have the misconception that software development, we just sit down and write a program. We just get something done, we know how to do it. And that's not really the case. Because we have to do that problem solving as we're developing, we have kind of a specific way of handling things, the methodology. The program development cycle is something that happens with all programs. And this takes that problem solving steps and kind of expands it a little bit for us for software development. So usually at the top, we analyze that problem, figure out what we got, design a solution, code the program, test the program, and revise it, and then we analyze. So think about Windows. Windows 8 came out somewhere in this cycle, right? As soon as Windows 8 came out, Microsoft and users started analyzing problems, right? They start again, complaints, people you know, not liking the way things worked. So they take all of those complaints and concerns and enhancement requests and then they design a solution they write code for windows 10 say they do testing in-house they ask for testers out in the field to do testing also they make sure that all of the bugs are taken care of as much as possible and they release the next release of windows and the whole cycle starts again so we're constantly cycling like that. So as a software developer, we have all the excitement of coding and creating the system. We get to put things to bed, as they say, say we're all done, take a breath, and then start back up again, seeing what needs to be changed. That's good, that's a good cycle because it means there's always jobs, right? Because we have to keep all of that cycle moving. As we're doing design, we need a way to record this information that we're getting from people. And we need a way to record the algorithms that we, we develop. And pseudocode gives us one way. 
pseudocode is just basically an English-like program plan. So I'm not using code per se, I'm just using regular language statements, but then I'm trying to make it into something that will remind me what the algorithm was. So let's look at this pseudocode here. In this pseudocode, there's a bad thing right off the bat. They put semicolons at the end of each line. A user that looks at this might actually get um, intimidated by those semicolons thinking that this is program code. So we probably don't want things like that in pseudocode. We want pseudocode to just be English sentences so we can take it to the director's assistant and say, is this the correct procedure? And if they see something that's too technical, sometimes they, they are um, afraid to help us because they think that it's stuff that they're not gonna understand. So we wanna make sure that everything is as English-like as possible. So here's our steps for making a cup of tea. We organize everything together, plug in the kettle, put the tea bag in the cup, put water in the kettle, wait for the kettle to boil, add water to the cup, remove the tea bag with a spoon or fork, add milk and or sugar and serve. So all of these steps here are documented for us. And if we don't talk to anybody about how to make a cup of tea for six months or a year, because we're working on other things, when we go back to this pseudocode then, we'll know exactly what steps we needed to take so we don't have to remember. Now, making a cup of tea, we could probably remember, but when we're talking to people about specific processes that are important to their company, we really need to document it because otherwise we'll forget. So that's pseudocode. It's like code, but it's pseudo. As I look at this pseudocode, a couple questions come up to me. Could this program require input? Is there maybe some things that we could add to this pseudocode? Should we maybe be asking, would you like milk or sugar? Because at this point, we're not asking that, and we don't really know that information. So that, that seems to be a shortcoming to me right away. So that's what pseudocode lets us do. Analyze our problem solving and see if it's actually accurate. Now, whenever I ask for input like that, that input, like would you like sugar or cream, is data, data for the program. Data is one of those words I know you can say multiple ways. And I'm from north of Chicago, so sometimes I say things the Chicago way. So I say data. If you say data, I won't hold it against you. So if a program asks for input, we need to keep track of that answer, right? We need to save that somewhere. We can't just say, oh, okay, great. I'm going to ignore what you said. I'm glad that you answered me. So if we asked how many sugars, we would need to have a variable set up to save that answer. And in our pseudocode, we could pretend that we had a variable like that. Now I'm jumping off a little bit here. If we were gonna create a data variable to hold information like how many sugars somebody wanted, what would be a good name for that variable? We're gonna start with our pseudocode making variable names valid from the very beginning, so we won't even ever make any that are wrong. When I'm creating a variable name like that, like how many sugars, it has to be all one word, no spaces. I can't start with a number. The variable name should be meaningful, so long names are allowed but we want to really, in general, keep it short and meaningful. Different programming languages have different suggestions or conventions for variable names. So one language might like you to make your variable name start with an uppercase letter, and another language might like you to make them start with a lowercase letter. But these rules, are across the board for every programming language. So if we just, in our pseudocode, 
make variable names that are valid, we'll be good to go. So here's some examples. Sure. You're good. All right, how about some of these? What about this, miles underscore traveled? Is that a valid variable name? Look good? Yeah, it's good. How about this one? What's wrong with it? Space. What about this one? Yeah. This one? No. That one? It's valid, but it's not very good, is it? No. It's kind of a really crappy variable name. Because what about when I have variable two, variable three, variable four, variable five? What about Z? Yes. Exactly. Same way. It's it's a yeah, not really usable. Now sometimes we will use a variable name that's just one letter because they're, we're in a certain loop or a certain activity, and, and we'll see that that that's kind of a common thing. But just to create a variable named Z is probably not a good idea. It's not going to help anybody figure out what was going on there. What about this one? No. Space again. What about this? No. What about that? Technically, it's valid, but it's not good because it's extremely long. Exactly. It's, it's very, very long. In <laughs> the kind of programmers that like these long names, they'd have 57 variables that all start with the same thing. So it's going to be cow who jumped over the moon, cow who jumped over the sun, cow who jumped over the hill. And they'll all start with all those same letters so that you can't find the right one. So you get in there because programmers that love those really long variable names tend to do that. But that's okay. That's their way of doing it. But it is kind of long. Now, sometimes we have reason to hold data that is constant, that never changes. Like the value of pi. When I'm creating an algorithm that needs the value of pi, I could just put this value right in my code, right? Radius time, 3.1415, whatever. I could just put that right in my code. But that's recommended against. That's a bad programming practice. The best programming practice is to create a constant variable named pi that holds that value. And then we refer to that pi variable when we need to use that value. Programmers in general learned this rule from the Y2K conversion, if that's something that you've ever heard about. Because when we went to the year 2000, there were thousands and thousands of programs who had that 19 just hard-coded all throughout the program. And so then developers had to look at every single occurrence. Is this a year or is this some other 19? Is this a year or is it some English country? So it, was, it became very, very tedious to fix all those programs. And they said, you know all the programs that have the, the century declared as a variable? were really easy to fix. And the ones that have essentially scattered out throughout all the things were really hard. So when we create a constant variable, just like this one, the convention is to use an all uppercase variable name. In this one, I didn't do that. Bad, bad. In our textbook, the prelude to programming one, the white one, they have some pseudocode for this very first chapter. And one of the applications that they talk about throughout the first chapter is the number of songs. So this is their idea of a, like a song download program. And so far, the pseudocode is pretty small. We'd like to write out this message Enter the number of songs you wish to purchase today. Now, notice some things about that message. We use the word write 
to say, that's gonna be displayed somewhere on the screen. And then the whole message that we want to be displayed on the screen is gonna be within these double quotes. Now that's a common thing for every programming language. Also, whenever we're working with alpha numeric data, letters and numbers, special characters, we always have to enclose those kinds of strings within double quotes. We call that a string, and if we have a string value, it has to be enclosed within quotes. Now this pseudocode continues on and says that after that message is written to the screen, we are going to wait until the user types something and then read in the value the user types. We're gonna input that value into a variable named songs. So just these two lines of pseudocode are potentially gonna do a bit if it was something that was implemented in a programming language. So that would be our pseudocoding. Do I? What is a string? What is a string? Any alphanumeric value. So these little pop ups here kind of point out some of those areas again. The input statement is special and it instructs the computer to read the keyboard input. Okay. So that's the beginning of our pseudocode. Input prompts are the strings that we display to ask for data. So in this example, our prompt says, enter a number, right? So everything within the double quotes is the prompt that we're gonna to display to our users. When we begin programming, we begin using these console character-based type programs, so it's kind of hard for us. But you can also think of a prompt like a prompt on a website. You know, if you're on this nice website and it's asking you what your name is, that's a prompt in the same way. So our prompts are starting out programming, going to just be character-based things to say, please give me this information. But as you work in other areas and as you learn more things, you'll get away from the character-based prompt. Now, whenever we're worried about a user inputting data, we need a prompt to ask them for the data, and then we need an input statement to read the data. In our input statement, we want a name of a variable that's gonna hold that data. Does that make sense? Here's another one. In this example, our prompt asks the user to enter two numbers, and then we have two input statements. So as they type those numbers, we'll get both of those saved into those variables. Okay, so let's look at our pseudocode now. They came along and they said, we want each song to cost 99 cents, and we want you to display how much it would cost for all the songs that they asked for. So here we're doing a calculation. And we're jumping in doing all sorts of things. So there's a, a lot of stuff that we'll be touching on again. So just don't get too overly involved in the details. Just kind of look at this from a really high level thinking, oh yeah, this pseudocode is giving instructions on what's going to go on here. So we're going to write out our prompt. How many songs do you want to purchase? We're going to read in how many songs they want. Then to know how much the cost is going to be, we need a variable to hold that cost. So the variable we're going to use is going to be called dollar price. And we're going to say that we should set dollar price equal to 99 cents times 
the number of songs they want. And then we should write out that answer. So that's our pseudocode. Now there's lots of stuff right now that we haven't talked about. We haven't talked about doing math in our programs and our pseudocode. So we're ju just really jumping in. So that's okay. Just look at it, like I say, from a high level and think about, okay, I see what's going on here. The things I want you to really think about right now are that it has to be in the right order, right? What happens if I input songs before I write the prompt? The user wouldn't know what I wanted them to type in, would they? Because they wouldn't see that prompt. What if I tried to update the dollar price and put this line of code at the very beginning? It wouldn't work right because I wouldn't know how many songs they wanted yet. So think about the order of things, that we have to do things in this certain order to get it to work right. Questions about that? Now, in this example, we're testing our, we're doing a desk check, walking through this algorithm, and I see the first thing that would happen is the message, the prompt, enter the number of songs you wish to purchase today would be displayed. The program would just sit there waiting for the user to type something. The user's gonna type 74. They want a lot of songs. Whoops. We're gonna use our math to calculate a value for our dollar price. Our value is going to be 99 cents times how many songs they wanted. And our dollar price is going to end up being $73.26 because they wanted a lot of songs. Whenever we are setting that dollar price, that's called an assignment statement. When we do an assignment statement, we're updating the value of a variable. We might be doing that with math. We might be doing it with an input statement. But we're updating the value. Let's see where we are, because I want to show you guys that. pseudocode assignment that we have because it's pretty short and I don't want you to be worried about it. So I'm going to stop here and let's take a look at that assignment because I think that you'll be comfortable with it. Now, the assignment that I'm looking at, let me go into our course here. Is this one right here, reorder the pseudocode. Now, all of our week one assignments, the due date is January 21st. That's next Thursday. We don't, we'll have plenty of time on Tuesday to get all of these done. So, do be reading your chapter and looking at these chapter one review questions. Get your syllabus quiz done. But this reorder the pseudocode, we have time to come back to it next week if we need to. Let's take a look at it. We don't have much time. Our power thing was unexpected. Now it's not gonna open for me. It's not going to let you get to it, huh? Let me fix that. Right. I guess I just made it to where nobody would try it at home and get frustrated. Made it just during class. Okay, you should be able to get to it now. I 
It's just a little Word document. So what we've got here up at the top is some pseudocode that's not in the right order. And it's pretty obvious what's not in the right order if you really, really think about it. And at the bottom, This looks really weird. It's just the same one in it. Let me fix this. I think that somebody's answer got saved. What I want from you, I will fix that. But the, the answer down here that says problem fee in correct order, don't worry, it's not in correct order. Ignore that for now, sorry. But he, up here where we have this pseudocode, these are all the lines of pseudocode that you need. And I want you to delete what's below that, and you do your own problem three in the correct order. You're going to use these lines. So what would be the first line of code that we'd want in our pseudocode? What do you think? Do what? Yeah, we could do either one. So declaring things first is always really good. So we could declare, like, f is float. Do we want to declare c is float up there at the top also? We'll talk a lot more about it next time. But basically, we have to declare those variables until our language, what type of data they're gonna hold so that it can use them effectively. So it's a really good idea for us to do that at the top. After that, do we want to input a value or write out a prompt? Sure. That sounds good. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with that. We're gonna work on this Tuesday together, but do take a look at it and see if you can solve it on your own, figure out what's going on. There's a lot of reading that needs to happen in chapter one. So like I said, take a look at this and the chapter one, short answers. You've got this. We'll get going. Sorry, we had that power glitch kind of mess up our timing. We'll get it all fixed. We'll get back on track. But get out of here. Have a great three day weekend. And I'll see you next Tuesday. Would you say it's okay with the moment to start like reading the book just to? Oh, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll talk far ahead. This is like reading. <laughs> That's fine. No, I do think I think that it helps. Um, I am not good at explaining it, but I think that 
being exposed to it and then giving your brain kind of some time to assimilate it really does help a lot it really does because then you've kind of got an idea that these concepts are coming up so. okay, see it in the books, uh, the, the one with the language, um, the Python one. Python one is, is, is that the same one? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so I don't have to revise. Okay. No, should no, be, it should be fine. Because it was edition three or something. I don't even know if there's any differences, okay. but yeah, so you're fine. Really don't different. worry about it. Yeah. It's a lot easier than the first one. The way it's going right now. It wasn't really. So, Why? How so? Well, it was my first time oh. like, after like 20 years. Oh, yeah, so, so now you like know what to expect. Like, what <laughs> <laughs> and now it's just like second semester, so I'm like, okay. You got now this. You got about. this. I know, you almost <laughs> need some time to get situated, <laughs> don't you? <Yeah. laughs> it's hard. They always expect us to just jump into things, and it's like, I got to check the water. <laughs> See you later. I can't believe I had that whole seating chart made. <laughs> yeah, it's always frustrating to use Yep. I'm glad that we weren't all working on something that you guys lost. That would have been really torturous. <laughs> have a good weekend. You too. Thanks. Uh oh. <laughs> Just enough time that I, you know, do some studying or read or, or something, but not enough time to go home and then come I back. know. And that's how my schedule is on Monday and Wednesday. And like, Markley has her office hours during that time between my classes. And she's got. A lot going on where we just try to stay out of the office at the same time because it's just not big enough oh, yeah. for two people to be meeting with students at the same time and stuff like that. So I try to just give her her space. And so last semester, I had from 9.50 to 1.30, so I went home and got a lot of work done, you know. Yeah. But now my second class is at 12.30. So it's just enough difference to be like, oh. My Monday and Wednesday classes are rough on me. I didn't realize how bad they were going to be because for some reason I I just didn't think they were going to be on opposite sides of the campus. Oh yeah, because we don't have that happen very often. Monday I start, 9 a.m., I'm in Grant Hall. Uh -huh. And then I've got to get to the third floor of ICE. 10 minutes later. Wow. And then 10 minutes after that, I gotta be back in Grand Ball. So I have oh, no. no time. Like I will park somewhere between the two uh -huh. and I'll have my lunch in the back seat of my car and I will run through, I'll grab part of my sandwich and I'll eat on my way to my math class. I'll go through math and then I'll eat the other half of the sandwich oh, on no. my last class because it's the only there thing I can is. do. It's just no time. It's crazy. And well, it's the first time that I've ever had it to where they've been that back to far back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a math class that I had to have. So it, I'm plugged in to this, this spot where it's the only time that I had in my schedule mm -hmm. that I plug this class into. Mm -hmm. They offered it at different times that were better, but it interfered with other classes. So it's a hard two times. I'm repeating this course and my 130 course. Oh, uh huh. Because I had to drop the classes last semester. My grandmother had passed away. Oh, no. And my mother lives with me and she took it super hard. Yeah. So I was consoling her and between taking care of my mom, uh -huh. to get her through this my own feelings about it, explaining oh, yeah. to my children what happened, mm -hmm. not well, to mention travel. And I think it's really smart to just go ahead and withdraw yeah. instead of letting everything fall apart because I had one 
last semester who it wasn't his family, it was the, the girlfriend's family, but nobody, from what he said, nobody had ever experienced a loss like that before, and they just, they just weren't doing good. And you know, I didn't want to just look at him and say, well, you're just going to have to drop them because you're not. But you know, sometimes that's just what you've got yeah. to do based on what's happened. You can't help it. I did it's my like, absolute best. To yeah. Everything else. But it yeah. just gets you just sometimes. You know. So I dropped my math. I dropped both of my CIS courses. Mm -hmm. I did keep my physics course up, but it was because it was the only class that I had that was at a time where I could get away from the house mm -hmm. and attend the class and be mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, this is actually the third time I've taken this course. I, I took 120 uh, Neil Anderson oh, uh -huh. uh, back in 2008 or 2009. Wow. Way back. Um, and then when I started Reattending classes last semester, it had been so long. I wanted to retake the course, uh -huh. and I had passed his class with him a high B, and then I was tanking because of everything going on. So I withdrew from both mm -hmm. classes. And mm -hmm. So I'm doing it again. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just smart sometimes to just have to, you know, that's just what you got well, to do. I'm, I'm almost forty. Mm -hmm. I know where my strengths and weaknesses are, mm -hmm. and, you know, so if I've got to withdraw, i got to withdraw. That's but the way it is. My my goal is to make it through the entire semester without having to pull out of any of my classes. Oh, that'd be great. Um, the, the worst part is, is I'm, I'm going back to school because I need that associates. Not because I need to learn, but because I need to show my employers that I know what I right. say. That yeah. I know. yeah. I've been doing this for 20 years, mm -hmm. but you got to have that paper. I have that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. I lost out on a promotion last year because the people I was running against, one had a bachelor's and one had a master's, not even related to the field. But really, they had still a, just they having had it. A piece of paper mm -hmm. that said, hey, mm -hmm. I went to college. I've got experience. I've worked for Apple. I've worked for Hewlett mm -hmm. Packard. I, I've got big companies that can verify mm -hmm. that I know what I'm talking about, but I don't have that piece of paper. Right. And I was told flat out, you didn't get this promotion because the other candidates, uh -huh. despite your experience, have a piece of paper and people in HR think Say that's, that's worth more. Yeah. I'm qualified. Yeah, it's a hard one. And it's hard to explain to people like um, right now, I think things are changing, but in the past couple of years, we've had some of the employers here in town are super interested in our students yeah. and they'll hire people like that still just have one semester to go. And then those students will stop and not continue their degree program because they already have this awesome job. And then they don't realize that on down the road that could end up biting them because they don't get a promotion that, or something. That's what I felt. It's yeah. I, it's I easy was, to do. I graduated high school in 2000. Mm -hmm. I, I got out of high school and I basically went right into the workforce. Did you? Mm -hmm. And I attended a handful of classes. I was going to be an English teacher originally. Mm -hmm. And I started at MSU. I was gonna, I was gonna go on. I was gonna be a teacher, and then I was like, I enjoy English, but I don't think I can make other people enjoy English. Uh -huh. And that's gonna be a challenge as an English teacher. Yeah. So I said, you know what? I'm really, you know, I'm working mm -hmm. in computers. I'm good with computers. I'm just gonna continue down that path. And I got certified as a Microsoft Windows 2000 server administrator. Uh -huh. And I was doing uh, back office work and I maintained email servers and I, I started on Cisco certification. And life just took me a different direction. Mm -hmm. 
and then I became a dad, and then we went through that big drop job slump in 2008, and my life got upturned. Mm -hmm. I lost my job. Oh, no. Everything. So I just did what I could to pay the bills, and then I lucked into a position with Apple. And I worked for Apple for five years. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I left Apple is because I was working from home and my sixth child was on the way. Wow. And I, there's no way that I could have a newborn in the home and work. Mm -hmm. I had to get a job elsewhere. So I went over to American National. And I was there for three, almost four years. Mm -hmm. um, and then... I unfortunately got let go. So I was like, well, I'm going to go back into school. My wife's working. She doesn't really like it, but she can she can hold uh -huh. bills until I'm out of school. Oh, good. Yeah. It's a good plan. Yeah. Thankfully, you know, we, we've got options. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. No, I know. My daughter is 32, and she was home for Christmas, and a week before Christmas, she got her driver's license for the very first time, because when she was 16, 17, 18, she was having knee surgeries all the time, so she never got, she kind of, like, missed that window of getting her driver's license, and then she's, because she didn't have it, she's always moved to cities where she could get public transportation, so she's just done without it. I didn't get my license until I was 23 or 24, because uh, I wasn't a dad. I didn't uh -huh. have to have a car. I didn't mind walking everywhere if I had to. Um, all of a sudden, oh, yeah, you're about to be a father. And I'm like, oh, well, I should probably get this, <laughs> this silly thing. Um, and I, I got that license and you know and, but sometimes it's the only thing that it matters mm -hmm. you know I've, I've been turned down for jobs in the past for not having a license yeah she's she she works at the um library in new orleans and honestly with the the position that she's had for a long time she was required to have her license it's just that she she actually graduated college in 2009. You talk about the yeah. downturn when there were no jobs. That's when she got out of college at Missouri State. And so she couldn't, there was nothing. Yeah. And um, she ended up doing AmeriCorps. And so AmeriCorps placed her in New Orleans at the public library doing uh, computer tutoring. So it was like three years after Katrina. Oh, and there were wow. lots of people in Louisiana that had never actually seen a computer in person. So that was the kind of people she was training on computers. Yeah. And I was like, no, everybody's seen a computer. And she says, no, they haven't. You should see these people. She says, they have, they've never seen one in real life. They've seen them on TV, but they've never I, actually seen them. So. I used to do um, American Conversational English training with uh, HP. Uh -huh. And uh, I would teach call center employees in the Philippines and in India. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, basically, this is the region that we expect you to get your phone calls from. This is the way this region of the country speaks. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to teach them these little idioms. Like mm -hmm. in the Deep South, you don't power on or power off something. You cut it on and cut it off. Oh. And you would have to teach them these little things. Mm -hmm. So we had a group of us, you know, from various regions that would be teaching these people. And the number of people that we met in the Philippines that never had been around, Seen one. Mm -hmm. it, it was just staggering. And it, it, was, it was odd. My wife's Filipino, but she's lived in the U.S. for 30-something mm -hmm. years. She, if you were just speaking to her and you weren't seeing her, you'd never know she lived in any other Right. Uh, but... Uh, even in her direct family, when you're talking to them, like the things that she and I take for granted here is an extreme luxury there. Mm -hmm. You're looking at, you know, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars a year here is, you know, just at poverty level. 
you could live like a king down, down there. there. Yeah. I have a former student who was adopted from the Philippines and um, his mom came into a parent teacher conference and a, how did she put it? She was a good Christian woman and she said, um, you can't trust him, you know. He said, what do you mean? And she goes, you can't trust him. He's from the Philippines. He lies and steals and does everything that he can get away with. And I was like, you are saying that you're his mom? <laughs> so he had it kind of rough. But he's smart. He's in the Air Force now. And he was smart enough to realize that even though she might not be the nicest person, he was better off than he would be if he was still an orphan in the Philippines. So the, he decided that it was better. Thing. Yeah. My, my wife was adopted by her aunt. Mm. And uh, it, she was in a situation where when she was born, her birth mother and her birth father were going through a very bad divorce. And divorces in the Philippines, uh, at least at that time, tended to end in murder. Oh, wow. Uh, well, I mean, their, their current political climate, is, if you are a drug user. Yeah, he's just got everybody killing each other, huh? He's crazy. We're, we're not talking about, you know, going out and using these super heavy things. It's, mm -mm, just well, anybody that does something. I've, I've taken a prescription pill that doesn't belong to me. I might get killed. You know, I ran, I ran out of this prescription painkiller my doctor prescribed me, but my next door neighbor had a couple. He gave me one until I could see my doctor and the nosy person across the street found out. Now I've got the police at my door. Wow. It's, it's, it's crazy. crazy. Dave, uh, he's from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. He just came here two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, his mother came here who knows how long ago, and he stayed in the Philippines with his grandmother until she passed. And uh, he was telling me that his uh, grandmother told him, Mom, I'm about to go, you need to get to the U.S. Wow. It, it was getting bad. And then uh, Kelvin, on the mm -hmm. other side of me, he's from uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not as bad in Vietnam, but it, it's still. Rob. Yeah, it's really hard because I have another student who's taken, he's about done, that's from Vietnam, and, you know, there's just not a lot of options for staying in the country right now, mm -hmm. and so he's kind of panicking a little bit, you know, and it's like, I know companies that would probably sponsor him if he would move to their area, and to me, he came all the way from Vietnam, he should be willing but he needs to stay here in his mind. You know what I mean? It's like he's so far from home, I think he has to stay. Yeah. I think just even an hour away is like too much to handle. Thankfully, Springfield has a large Vietnamese community. Do they? And mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of opportunity for getting assistance, even if they don't know you, mm -hmm. uh, because they know how hard it is here. Mm -hmm. um, my, my friend Henry owns the uh, Vietnamese restaurant Bamboo. Uh, over there in the Chesterfield Center. Oh, okay. Uh, I've noticed. Just a few doors down from the old Heritage Cafeteria. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he will frequently uh, try and help people from Vietnam mm -hmm. try and get places to stay, mm -hmm. places to work. He'll, he'll even pay, you know, I, I don't know what you know about working in a restaurant, but I can always use the dishwasher. Yeah. For <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, he, he really, he's a really good guy about it, mm -hmm. but he can only help so much. Right. Um, mm, so many people. There's, uh, quite a few, uh, nail salons in the area where they will. That's actually what he said. He said, I don't want to work in a nail salon. And I was so confused because I don't do nails. <laughs> yeah. I did not realize that it was uh, a stranglehold thing. <laughs> so, um, I was actually at the nail salon with my wife one day, and uh, the owner of the nail salon, she's a real nice lady, she says, 
do you have any single friends? Because they're actively trying to set their oh, find some female guys. children up with mm -hmm. people. But see, so <clears throat> I'm from Carthage, and if a Hispanic person marries a white person, they were, that were, that's not enough. They weren't allowed into the country still yet from that. Yeah, you had to prove that you knew them. Um, those, those laws changed. It's something that I'm having to fight with. My wife's lived in the U.S. since 84. Yeah. Um, but we have to, um, because her dad missed a signature when he came out uh -huh. of the Air Force into the U.S., he didn't sign one single piece of paper. We have to prove that she belongs in the country anytime we have to do anything with the government. Really? She has to carry a uh, non expiring resident alien card everywhere mm -hmm. she goes. Wow. She came in at the tail end of the Carter administration. They were letting everybody mm -hmm. into the country. Mm -hmm. But she has that non-resident alien card that she has to carry. She's got, she's got a U.S. social security number, not a visa number. She has an actual social security mm -hmm. number, uh, and she's got um, all sorts of other things. But she has to carry that. Wow. And uh, resident alien cards uh, since 9/11 uh, have expiration dates. And the fact that hers doesn't is a huge red flag. People oh, think really? Fake. They think it's something's wrong with it. Yeah. Wow. So we have to have her passport with us at all times. So scary. Because I mean, the honest God is, she's from a country that people are being yeah kicked out from. You know, yeah. what I mean, she's she's not. We don't seem to like anybody she's not that's brown. Back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. But it, with the current political climate. If something goes wrong and we can't prove that she's supposed to be here, mm -hmm. that's where they're going to send her. Right. And they won't take her back because she's got American children. Mm -hmm. So she ends up being a person with Illegal no somewhere, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. so we, we've talked a couple of times about moving to Japan. She, she spent a good bit of time in Japan. Oh, did she? Mm -hmm. And... You know, it's something that we could potentially do. Mm -hmm. We both have family and friends in Japan. So are they taking people from anywhere? Or are you guys... Um, not not really from anywhere. It would be nice if you could get this degree and then you would have a better chance. Yeah. But I know. Um, it, it's more of a... They're looking for people that have skills. Mm-hmm. Um, Apple's got uh, places in Osaka 